Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Data View Show, episode number eight. I'm your host, Scott Hayes, lifetime IBM champion and IBM DB2 Gold consultant. You can follow me on Twitter there at SR Hayes. And I'm super delighted and very excited to have with us the infamous, super nice, incredibly intelligent Miss Ember Crooks. She's also an IBM champion an IBM Gold Consultant. Amber, how are you today? I'm doing great, Scott. How about you? Um, I'm having a really fabulous day. I have you as a guest on our show, and you're like a great presenter, so I'm we're super excited to see your presentation. And today's topic is theory to practice, DP2 HADR in the real world. Speaking of the world, where in the world are you physically located today? I am in Denver. I am at home in my home office in Denver. Oh, cool. And what's the weather in Denver? It's cloudy, which is really unusual for us, but we've had a lot of warm weather and very little snow in the Denver area this year. So. I think the Northeast is getting all the snow. I think and so. I, I, I used to live up in Rochester, New York, mm -hmm. and uh, then I moved south for warmer weather and lower taxes and things. And Man, I, I watched the national weather and God, I'm so thankful that I live in Texas now because New York <laughs> is getting creamed. All right, so you know, kicking into the show here somewhere, you can advance the slides. This is the gibberish that uh, we're required to share with everybody. The opinions expressed are that of Scott Hayes and the show guests and do not necessarily reflect that of IBM Corporation or the IBM community. DB2 is a registered trademark of IBM, which is also a registered trademark. We make no claims to any marks belonging to anyone. In other words, it's your stuff and we don't care. This event is being recorded and replays will be publicly available. Please mind your manners. Uh, very simple. Here's what's ahead. Got a few news bits for you. We're gonna have Ember's awesome presentation. We'll ask a few polling questions and then we'll tell everybody thank you. So upcoming shows. Uh, 6th of February, Buell Duncan is IBM Vice President of Marketing. That show is themed Marketing Strategy and Puzzles. Now, this isn't our ordinary technical type of presentation on the show, but I'm quite certain it's going to be a lot of fun because people want to know, you know, how is DB2 being marketed? How is other IBM technology being marketed? Why does IBM choose to do or not do the things that they do? And um, I think they're going to give us some um, ad campaign ideas and solicit audience feedback on the campaigns. So we may actually have an opportunity to influence IBM's marketing spend on the 6th of February. Look for that. Sign up on the show homepage. 13th of February, the day before Valentine's Day, Jason Tavaloris, IBM. AI and BI, augmented intelligence built into IBM Cognos Analytics. I'm excited to see that because Cognos, one of the data sources for Cognos could be DB2, and uh, I love DB2. 20th of February, Simon Lightstone, cloud, get started, make your business agile, and he's going to also teach how to build a chat bot in 15 minutes, so that'll be cool. And the 5th of March, protecting sensitive data with Guardian. And uh, that's by Tim Tate, who is an, actually an IBM customer. So it'll be another real-world experience like Ember's today. He's going to talk about their Guardian experiences and best practices. Some URLs to visit. Hey, make sure you join the IBM community if you haven't yet. Uh, you get all the scoop and skin on what's going on with different uh, softwares and things IBM-related. 
in at this URL, there's a tool called the DB2 Augmented Data Explorer. It's a graphical user interface and it helps you find out things about your data that you might not know. And best part, drum roll, blah, 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 it's free. Uh, IBM samples are now on GitHub. You can try out the new DB2 console by going this URL. You can get a free book on using DB2 and JSON by going here. Make sure you're checking out iDug, iDug.org. Register early and save. The early bird discount is still available for Dallas. And that's in early June. And uh, another URL I'm quite fond of, I learned about this uh, last November, ibm.com slash cloud Watson Studio Auto AI. There's a really cool tool from IBM and, and you can, uh, I'm sure it does much more than this, but the demo that I saw, you just uh, feed it Excel spreadsheets and then it tells you things about your data that you didn't know, and that's pretty cool. So check that out. All right, uh, enough gibberish from me. Theory to practice, DB2 HADR in the real world with uh, Ember. And let's make Ember the presenter. I see there's already a question in the queue, Ember. Okay. Cool. Would you like questions as we go or hold them to the end? I like them as we go. As we go. All right. I'm going to make you the presenter. And if I see some relevant questions, I'll, I'll chime in with you. Okay. Sounds great. Click that button and we'll see your screen. I see a screen. It looks like a PowerPoint. Uh, let me flip the displays here. There we go. You are the master of your monitors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, great. I, I've got a three monitor setup, so I have to be careful. <laughs> one of them's portrait. Okay, so um, one of the reasons that I came up with this presentation is I wanted to share some some horror stories from uh, so examples that I've seen of problems in the real world. Um, we're going to go over those towards the end. Um, and before that, I wanted to cover a couple of topics that I see people kind of um, not having quite as much expertise as it might be nice. So some details that I think it's really um, important to understand well. Um, so we're going to go through and 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 cover those topics. Um, I'd love to have questions throughout at the end, whatever you'd like there, and I'll give my contact information at the end too because I'm active in the community and I'd love to hear um, other problems, other questions that people have. Okay, so if we, uh, if we, I want to start out with laying out a basic HADR solution. So HADR only requires two servers, um, and usually if we have only two servers, they're what we see in the HA mode here on the, on the left in the purple box. Um, usually that's in one data center where we have a primary database server and an HA standby database server. Um, and we're usually using something like TSAMP or another product to have a virtual IP that clients can connect to. And we connect that virtual IP to either of the two servers, depending on which one is primary at the time. If we want to add a DR component, that's usually in another data center, we can add one or two databases in that data center. Um, the maximum number of total standbys is three, so we can't have more than this at this time. Um, and sometimes we'll have one of those servers on a time delay. That's a, a good option to uh, account for human error, which honestly human error is the thing that I've spent the most restore time in my career on is human error. Um, somebody updating something without a where clause, things along those lines that, that really um, take time in order to recover from. So the HADR ecosystem is not just HADR. HADR is kind of the base. It keep, keeps the data synchronized between two to four database servers, and nothing is shared between those database servers. Uh, they connect over the same network, but they don't share network cards, they don't share disk, they don't share anything. So um, that gives us a high level of protection. If we have a disk problem on one server, well, that's easy. We, we flip over to the other server. We have a motherboard go bad on one server, we flip over to another server. 
we usually pair HADR with TSAMP because TSAMP comes for free for this purpose. Um, and what TSAMP does is it provides a heartbeat monitor, uh, it detects failures, and it fails the database over. It can also manage a virtual IP address, and it's actually a full-featured tool that does a lot more than that, but those are the purposes that we use it for with DB2. And finally, we have automatic client reroute. Now, technically, with some applications, automatic client reroute can be used without TSAMP um, in order to reroute traffic to another server. But when we use it in co combination with HADR and TSAMP, it really provides us with kind of a retry functionality for some applications so that that failover is as transparent as humanly possible. Now, when we're thinking about this or other DB2 options, it's good to have an idea of what DB2 solutions there are depending on your organization's goals. It's very important to have for your organization what are your requirements at the database layer and to make sure that your company is putting the funding behind those requirements to make sure that you can actually achieve the goals that, that you need to. So if we want to achieve just one nine or 90% uptime, um, we can absolutely use standard DB2 for that. That's up to 36 days per year of downtime. That sounds like a large number, but with standard DB2, we can usually get higher if we get lucky, um, but we can't really guarantee that we can get up, to, that we can actually get a full two nines of availability. If we want two nines or three nines, HADR is really the choice and we can get really close to four nines with HADR. Um, the main thing that whether we can get uh, to a full four nines with HADR depends on is the database size and the main reason is because we have um, we, we still have to take an outage for for upgrade and for um, certain scenarios we may have to still take an outage so that's that's why we look at it that way if we're looking at really guaranteeing four nines or getting all the way to five nines then we're looking at pure scale um, and we're probably looking with pure scale for high availability and then either HADR or replication for our disaster recovery. If we use it with replication, then we can actually manage to keep a database online through a version level upgrade. Um, and that, the reason for that is the only thing that, that can handle a version level upgrade with DB2 is replication. You can replicate between two different versions. There's also this feature called reads on standby. What that would allow us to do is get read-only access to the database or databases on the standbys. It can be used on one standby or on multiple standbys. Um, it has a few restrictions and it's really not entirely suitable for a full reporting server. Um, the main reasons it's not really suitable as a full reporting server is that the standby only has the same indexes as the primary. So we can't get different indexing for the different workloads that we would see on the primary server for OLTP and the standby server for reporting. We also can't create temporary tables. Um, we can't do explain on the standby and we can't query lobs that aren't inlined and not inlining lobs is the default. So we have to be careful with that on the standby. They've done some great um, improvements in availability on the standby. It used to be before mod pack four of 11.1. Um, it used to be that query execution on the standby wasn't possible when there was any DDL operation on any object when there was a run stats or a reorg or a table move or something like that going in. Um, with mod pack four of 11.1 and uh, the base code of 11.5, it decreases the impact of those restrictions. So it makes it so those restrictions only apply to the one table or two tables or whatever it is being impacted and not entire, the entire database. HADR licensing is also pretty easy. Um, you want to verify any licensing statements I make with IBM before relying on this information. It changes fairly frequently. Um, in general, HADR is included in every DB2 edition of the most recent versions. In general, we license the primary server normally. We don't have to buy any additional HADR license. And then on the standby, if we're not using reads on standby, the, the rule is 100 PVUs, which is about one, one and a half cores, maybe two cores, which is often smaller than our database size. If we are using reads on standby, then the standby does have to be fully licensed at this time. 
Um, and you probably want to look in if you're getting your DB2 licenses through HDMP points or any of the newer methods, you want to look in to see what that looks like for your standby. Licensing also changes with each new version, uh, but it usually seems to do that for the better and, and get a little bit easier and a little bit better. So I'm hoping that HADR will, will continue that trend and go in that direction. Amber, you wanted questions as we go, and somebody yep. asked, can you clarify if TSAMP can automatic manage a VIP with two servers on different network subnets? No, it, it, it absolutely cannot. Um, unfortunately, um, at this point, that's not an option. Okay, so the answer is no. Right. And I know that and I know that off the top of my head because I've been trying to, to work on a situation like that lately and it, 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 it will not. And somebody else uh, chimed in and said on the read on standby, they can use the DB2 EXPLN command for explain. Okay, so that may be possible. I haven't tested that. Um, the methods that I use are usually setting the the explain mode to explain and using DB2 EXFMT or running um, or running the stored procedure to explain from section. So um, I'll have to look into that. I'm not. I, I was not aware of that. Well, you got people excited on this TSAMP thing. Somebody wants to know: Is there any other software to replace TSAMP? We're actually going to talk about that a little bit later in the presentation about some of your options there. So let's let's defer that until we get to that part. Okay. Is there a recommended length of time for the delay between primary? Okay. Oh, right? so primary so if you, and standby. Right. So if you put us one of your standbys on a time delay, the important thing to think about in determining what that time delay is is how long it would take you to notice that there's a problem. In some environments, you might notice immediately, some tables you might notice immediately, and others it might be two or three days before you would figure that out, right? So the important number to come up with there is how long would it take you to notice that a mistake had been made? If you're in an organization where it would be noticed immediately, then you could go with an hour maybe. Um, I personally, in the environments that I see, and I probably wouldn't want to go with any less than four hours because it often takes a while to figure out what happened to the point that you would you would be willing to, to go back and look at that. Okay, thank you for answering those questions. Carry on. Clear right. the question queue. <laughs> Great. Okay, so I want to talk about the HADR synchronization modes because it's something that was important to me to understand um, all the details of when I was considering what was right, what was right for every implementation that I've done of it. Um, so in order to talk about this, we're going to start with looking at what commit processing looks like without HADR. Um, when we're talking about HADR, HADR is kind of like log shipping, but log shipping is at the log file level, whereas HADR is at the log buffer level. Um, and there are um, re responses required for some of our, our synchronization modes from the standby server. So for non-HADR commit processing, we have a commit that comes in uh, to our database server. Our database server writes the log buffer, which is a memory area, out to the log file, which is on disk. And after that, the commit is considered successful. Um, this is a fairly fast process, and we want it to be because there can be hundreds, thousands of commits per second um, uh, on databases. So we want to make sure that that's as fast as possible. Okay, so if we talk about the first HADR mode, sync, um, what sync does is when a commit comes in, it will take the log buffer and it will send that log buffer uh, to the HADR send buffer, which is another memory area on your primary server. It will then send that across the network to the HADR receive buffer on the standby server. On the standby server, the receive buffer will write out to the log buffer and then the log buffer will write out to disk. After all that work is complete on the standby, an acknowledgement will be sent back to the primary. And the primary, while all that's going on, will also be writing out to the transaction log file. Um, and, uh, and then once all of that is complete, that's when the commit is considered successful. So you see, instead of our little three-step process, we've added in uh, several areas of concern. We've added in disk on our standby server, so that's a part that could be slow. And we've also added in network between the two database servers. So if we're, if we're using a sync mode, we want that network to be super fast for that communication. 
Now the next HADR mode I want to talk about is near sync. Um, near sync, what near sync does is when a commit comes in, it will write the log buffer out to that HADR send buffer, send that over the network. And then the, the acknowledgement will come immediately back from the, H, from the, from the standby. Um, and, and then it will also, of course, do the local processing. It will write the log buffer out to the log file, and then your commit will be considered successfully. So with this method, what we've done is we've eliminated disk on the standby server. So there's a lot less that has to go on on the standby server before we get an acknowledgement back. But we also, but we still have that network in the middle. So that's still something that can slow down. We still need that network to be super fast. All right, um, async. Um, so the first two methods we talked about, sync and near sync, are high availability modes. Um, the next two we're going to talk about, async and super async, these are disaster recovery modes. So for async, uh, what happens when our commit comes in is it is sent out to that HADR send buffer, um, and it is and it is also written out to the transaction log on the local server and then it's considered successful. So notice there is no acknowledgement back from the standby. And that's good in that in as far as speed goes because we get the network out of the way. We're not we're not putting a network in the middle of my commit. Uh, but now we have no acknowledgement. So we have a higher risk of data loss in uh, in real failure scenarios. And then finally, the final HADR mode is super async. In this mode, um, when a commit comes in, we have that commit, uh, the log buffer will be written out to disk, and then the commit will be considered successful. So notice that that processing is exactly the same as what we see without HADR involved. So super async is the method where there should be no, uh, no uh, performance impact from HADR. But there's also no guarantee, there's no peer state, so we don't know for sure um, if our standby is exactly in sync or not. Now I have a slide here with a, a good summary of the, the various HADR modes. They're on two spectrums. They're on a spectrum of a low chance of lo data loss to a higher chance of data loss, and also on a, a spectrum of a high chance of performance impact to a low chance of performance impact. So this is a good summary slide to come back to if you want to remember and you want to evaluate which sync mode might be ready, might be best for a particular scenario. That is a really great summary slide, and you've inspired new questions from our audience. Great. Uh, Jean Bernard would like to know how to set up the time delay. Maybe you'll cover that later, or try yeah, I'm out. not. I'm actually not going to go into that in this um, in this particular uh, presentation because we don't have enough time for for every topic I would love to cover. Uh, but there is a, a parameter, a, a database. Let's see. I think it's. I think it's a, a registry parameter, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, I can get back, if he wants to email me, I can get back to him with what that parameter is. All right, and does TSAMP support HADR async mode? That's from Brandon. Hmm, I've never personally used it with async. Um, so I don't know for sure. I know that when we're talking about the HADR uh, time parameters, those are only supported by sync and near sync. Um, so again, that's one I don't know, but if he wants to email me, my email address will be at the end and I'll be happy to research that and get back to him. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so HADR setup. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. I have a bunch of blog entries on all of this on HADR and a super in-depth series on on TSAMP. It's five parts because uh, there were there was just too much for uh, blog entry at datageek.blog. So I'm going to take this at a fairly high level. Feel free to ask questions, but some of the some of the answers may be to refer people to those blog entries. Um, for HADR, um, we want identical servers with, whenever possible. Um, the operating systems can be at slightly different levels, but not different versions, for short periods of time. And that short periods of time, that's IBM's wording. 
So there's no, you know, it must be upgraded within a week, within a day, whatever, whatever that number is. Just be careful not to go too far on that sort of thing. I've never been comfortable with going more than a week um, with different levels. Uh, your file systems need to be mostly identical. There are some that you can tweak if you need to. Um, the version of DB2 must be identical. You can't use an HADR rolling upgrade for a version level upgrade. It has to be the same version of DB2. Your fix pack, however, on the standby can be later than the primary for short periods of time. And that's also IBM's wording, short periods of time. I'm generally not comfortable with more, more than a day um, at the outside, but usually I, it's less than that. Um, usually the only thing I use that for is to do a rolling fix pack because you can do rolling fix packs with HADR. I've actually done them um, during business hours for a, a client who wanted to, to see a fix pack with no outage and they saw no outage. They had load tested enough that they understood what that failover looked like for their application. Now, when you look into the config parameters, these are most of the ones related to HADR that you're, you're going to be playing with. This is the HADR sync mode here. Um, in this case, it's set to near sync. That's what we were talking about before as far as what synchronization mode you want. There are uh, five parameters that kind of define the servers and define the services and the instance name that's going to be involved. Now keep in mind that all of these settings are um, if this server is the primary server. This is, that's, that's how you need to think about a lot of these settings. HADR target list is a critical one and a newer one. It wasn't in the original um, HADR settings. It was added to allow for multiple standbys. So with HADR target list, you put your server name and your server port for what would be the primary if this server, or what would be the principal standby if this server were the primary. And then you put other servers after that so that um, DB2 knows where to communicate for those as well. Now, a couple of the parameters that I find people have the struggle the most with um, are uh, HADR time parameters. We have the, the, the HADR timeout parameter. And what this is, is the number of seconds before DB2 considers the two database servers disconnected. So remember, DB2 is waiting for that response back. We don't want DB2 to wait forever for that response back, because if DB2 waited forever for that response back, that would be, mean that now I have to have two servers up in order to run a database. And that's kind of the opposite of high availability. That's, that's really relying on more things. So generally that time should be long enough to allow for short network glitches. The default is 120 seconds and that works in most environments. I have seen people run with that number as low as 10 in network environments that are super tight and don't have any issues. I've seen 120 be questionable in environments where the network is just horrendous and has all kinds of issues. So it, it really depends on the environment, but 120 is a nice place to start if you don't know anything else. HADR peer window is the seconds after HADR becomes disconnected, so that's after HADR timeout has passed, where DB2 still waits for an appropriate response from the standby before committing transactions. And this is really meant for when you're using TSAMP or when you're using another uh, one of the options for automating failover. We'll talk about more of the options in a minute here. Um, but what what it is, what it should be, is it should be long enough to allow whatever tool that is to detect the fail the problem and for failover to occur. Um, it only applies to sync or near sync, and that's what makes me think that TSAMP might not work with async. Um, 300 is a good starting point for this. It lower works in some environments. What you don't want to do is you don't want to leave it at the default of zero. So the default of zero um, will lead to some really interesting and painful uh, uh, failover problems if you leave it there. It may prevent you from being able to fail over in some cases. Um, if you ask me how I know, it's because I've seen it set at zero and I've seen it cause serious problems. So set it to something um, and 300 is probably a good place to start. With all of that, your maximum failover time is HADR timeout plus HADR peer window. So that's the maximum time it might take for a failover. And that's why some people try to tune these parameters down more is to make it so that their, their, um, their pause in their database activity is as short as possible.
All right, any more questions we should talk about, Scott? Let me check. I think there's a one that did sneak in. Which file systems should be recommended to create as a share? The archive logs, backups, maybe? That's from so Miguel. So I tend to share nothing. Um, I like the shared nothing approach. There is an argument in certain scenarios. So there's an argument um, if you're doing load operations against the database, you need a shared file system for that. So you have a place for the copy files. Um, there are arguments for sharing the um, archive logs directory so that you have access to those from either server. So if you fail over and then you need to recover, you have access to those. Uh, but if you're doing that, you really want that file system to not be mounted on either server, to not be, you know, resident on the disks on either server, but to be on some some um, other location where if a, a failure affects things, it won't affect that. And have you seen on the previous screen the delay setting? So maybe that delay that people were looking for was in the config parameter. Ah, there it is, HADR replay delay, yep. Yep, so that's okay. that's the place in seconds where you set what you want the delay to be for this particular server. Perfect, and okay. just cleared the queue again, carry on. Great. Okay, so I also like to run HADR in at least one non-production environment. Um, uh, at, most of the time, my first choice for that is a load test environment. So if you have a dedicated load test environment, I think that should always include HADR that's as close to your production configuration as possible. And what that does is that makes it so that when you do a load test, um, the HADR performance impact is accounted for and is included in that load test. Now, if you are doing it in a load test environment and you only do load tests maybe once a month or at specific times, um, especially if you're talking about a cloud environment, you could have the standby for that load test environment be down um, and just re reinitialize that standby whenever you go to do a load test to save some money. Um, you, from my perspective as a DBA, I want at least one non-production environment for HADR so that I can test an upgrade or any other kinds of changes that I might do that might have an HADR effect or an HADR complication. And that's even more true if you have DBAs who aren't familiar with HADR, which to be honest, any of us might have at any time. We hire somebody new and it's perfectly reasonable to be an experienced DBA without having touched HADR at this point. So um, it's important to have that. However, not every non-production environment needs to include HADR. So in the environments I work in, we generally have a dev, QA, stage, load test, and prod. We usually have HADR in prod, load test, and sometimes in QA. So we can, um, so we can actually, so we can keep QA up fairly, uh, fairly highly available because that's one of the environments that's most used in some of our environments. We almost never have uh, dev in um, uh, on HADR. It doesn't make a lot of sense, um, especially when you have multiple dev environments. I had one client who had 18 different dev environments, um, and that would be ridiculous to do HADR for all 18 of them. Now, the biggest problems that you run into with HADR, there are some that you run into during setup. There's a typo. Um, and I once spent like three hours on the phone with support um, trying to figure out a problem before we realized that I had typed a 1-0 where I meant a 0-1 in, in an IP address so, or a server name, I think it was. So that's absolutely something that, that happens um, on setup. Usually you double check. And if on my team, if we have any problems when we're doing something like that, we have one of the other DBAs check us over and make sure that we didn't make a mistake like that. There can also be issues with network if there's a firewall between the two servers. Um, HADR is actually fairly sensitive to host name changes or host name problems. Generally, you need to have a host file that's properly set up and you need to have your db2 nodes.config be correct. On an ongoing basis, you always check HADR status five minutes after you've started it because HADR will, will sometimes come back and say, hey, set successfully started, and you think it's just going through catching up with the log files and going through all of that. Um, and then sometimes during that process, it runs into a problem. Um, so I always wait five minutes and check the HADR status before I go back to bed or before I consider the, the problem solved. You uh, check corollary... before you go to bed? I'm sorry. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, what's that? Me too before you go to bed? <laughs> no, this is usually when you get called in the middle of the night to deal with the problems. <laughs> That's why. Right. I'm well, you mentioned the, the host file, and someone asked in case if standby server is renamed to a different number and while updating remote host on the primary, does it require a restart? Um, I believe it would require a restart of HADR on the standby and a restart of HADR on the primary. Since version 10.5 fixed pack four, all of the HADR parameters are dynamic and should generally take um, effect without a restart of the entire instance or the entire database. And another, I found reinitialize HADR takes too long. Backup, restore, configure. Do you have the best way to restart TSA and HADR? So the it, it's really just necessary in some cases to to reinitialize HADR with that um, part of with, with a backup and a restore. Um, part of what you can do is monitor HADR really well so that you catch it right away. Um, if you catch a problem right away, you're you're more likely to be able to restart without doing a full reinitialize. Very good. And uh, Rajesh asks, can we install only the client version on both? the server? Um, you need a full server version of DB2. You can't install just a client. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, and um, so we talked about monitoring being really important. I consider HADR going down a SEV1 uh, event that I want to get called out of bed for. The main reason being because I have been on a recovery scenario where HADR went down at two in the morning, um, and at that point I was not alerted. Um, and then at five in the morning, we lost the entire RAID array. Uh, so in that particular scenario, we didn't have data loss because the disks weren't ter terribly working well <laughs> in that in that um, mode between the two. But it was still a very scary scenario to run into that you have a full rate array failure um, when HADR was not working. So always monitor HADR, and I very much prefer to be woken up out of bed and deal with it immediately rather than dealing with a nightmare restore scenario. You wanna be careful with unsupported loads. There's a parameter called block non-log that should always be set to yes. It is not defaulted to yes, but if you set it to yes, it will help you with that in, in quite a lot for unsupported loads and non-logged actions. That's one of our complications of HADR as well, load operations. Make sure you have a shared disk for that, for your load copy files, and make sure that you know what you're doing and you've tested some scenarios around that. Uh, replication can be another complication. If you have your HADR database as a source or a target, you want to make sure that replication is set up on your standby as well, because some of those uh, replication tools might require installing some code. You want to make sure you have that code and you have all of your configurations on the standby so that if you fail over, you can still do the replication. Um, you have to watch out for applications that store values that are specific to a database server or change for a different database server. There are very few of those, but there are a few applications that might store that. Changes to server names and IP addresses, as somebody had asked, um, that's absolutely something you want to be aware of and you're going to have to address when it happens. Um, it's not difficult, you just have to make sure that you do address it when it happens because HADR will fail if you don't. Um, there are also situations that can affect availability or connectivity to both the principal and the standby at the same time. I had a client with really, really bad network, um, and they would frequently reboot both servers at the same time, um, and that would cause some problems when they came back up, especially if they didn't bring up the standby before the primary came up. Any more questions? As a matter of fact, someone just asked, Rajesh, does SSL configuration work in DB2 version 10.5? No, SSL for HADR was, let's see, I'm pretty sure, I don't know the fix pack off the top of my head. I think it was, actually, I think it might have worked. I don't know. Um, if he emails me, I'll look that up um, so I have the exact fix pack it was introduced in. I'm thinking it was 11.1 .1 fix pack 2 or 3, but I could be incorrect on that. Um, SSL was not originally available for use with uh, HADR when it was introduced with the rest of DBT. 
And Guy says we installed CDC on the shared disk and integrated in TSA with failover. I don't think that's a question. It's just, yeah, that's a great, that's actually a great strategy um, as long as that shared disk doesn't go down when one of the servers goes down. So the shared disk would need to be on some other location so that you don't have a problem with that. Thank you, that's it. Great. Okay, so I wanted to talk should quickly. I, should I ask the um, polling questions oh, now? Yes, great time for that. We're, we're about at the halfway point. We'll give mm -hmm. your voice a break. I have to figure out my stuff again here. Okay, let's ask some polling questions of our good looking audience. Hello, audience. Interactivity. How long have you been working with DB2 LUW? This is audience participation. Checking in with our huge audience today. <laughs> kind of not surprised by their results based on the state of the DB2 universe study that we did last year and we'll be doing again this year. Please look for it and participate when the study comes out. 30 seconds or 80% voted. Going once, going twice, closing the polls, sharing the results. We have lots of experienced people, 41% over 15 years, 21%, 11 to 15. And we've got some new people, 7%, zero to two. Okay, thanks for participating. And Ember sent some questions. Uh, have you worked with DB2 HADR in the last year? Let's see, uh, see how people, see if people are, are using HADR. Of course, for some databases, you're right, it may not be needed. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of holdouts, right? We're at 78% voted. A couple more people. Click the mouse button. Give us your response. There we go. Closing the poll, sharing the results. Almost half the audience says yes, daily or weekly. So that is one of the most popular features of DB2HADR. 31% yes a few times. 19% would like to be using it. 2% say they don't need it. Next polling question, does your organization have defined values for RTO and RPO for their databases? And I'm gonna let Ember explain what RTO and RPO are. RTO is the recovery time objective. It's if things go down, how much time does it take you to get a functioning database back up? And RPO is recovery point objective. If you have a failure like that, how much data do you lose? Very good. More acronyms. What a world of acronyms we live in. Okay, well, the results on this one are, are pretty interesting. I'm going to give people a few extra seconds to respond because they got to think about this one a little bit. Going once, going twice. Closing the poll, sharing the results. And there's the results. 30% yes, and they have funding. 20% yes, but uh, this is like we have the rules, but not the money to back it up, which is unfortunate because that makes people uncomfortable. 32% say kind of. Everything has to be up all the time. 19% saying no. Okay, and if you run HADR in production, do you have a non-prod environment where you can test? So we'll let people answer this one. What is your favorite beverage today, Amber? You were always famous for the uh, Diet Cokes. What are you having today? What, right when I'm right before speaking, I usually stick with. Uh, well, at home, I have ice mint tea with uh, some sweetener in it. Okay. 
All right, that's uh, the elapsed time is up. Going once, going twice, closing the poll, sharing the results. And this is a uh, confessional. 43% have at least one non-prod HADR environment, which means production environment. That's probably a best case scenario. 29% says, yep, we have HADR in one or two non-prod environments. 9% kind of, we got a sandbox, and 20%, nope, we don't have HADR in a non-production environment. Uh, that seems uh, a little risky, don't you think, there, Ember? Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm curious if some of those people don't have HADR, too. So. Right. And the uh, question is kind of more fun. How did you hear about today's show? We, we promote our shows on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Uh, we have a newsletter that goes out twice a month. Uh, the homepage is actually very popular. And uh, the IBM community is also a big sponsor. We put the events there and blogs. All right, going once, going twice, closing the poll. And the results. Uh, today, 57% say the newsletter, 22% the IBM community, and then some other sources, Twitter and LinkedIn, Data View Show homepage. So thank you for that feedback. We'll keep those newsletters coming out twice a month, but not more than twice a month because we hate spam and junk mail too. And that's it for the polling questions. I'm going to put you back on, Amber. Make presenter. All righty. Okay, so I'm going to um, talk about the HADR tools quickly. I've got really good blog entries out there on how to use these HADR tools. These are tools that come from IBM in a wiki um, that, that can be really useful, particularly for understanding what impact various um, various modes of sync modes of HADR might have on your specific hardware and your specific workloads. When you put them all together, you run all three of them, you get something that looks like this. Um, and what this does is it tells you for each time period it analyzes, given your actual transaction logs, um, which would these modes impact performance and by how much? You can either get zero question marks, one question mark, two question mark, or three question marks. Um, so if you run this kind of analysis on servers you're thinking about using HADR on or that you're currently using HADR on, um, and you get a high number of question marks for the sync mode you want to use, you want to reconsider that and think about how much that might impact your performance. Okay, automating takeover. This was something that somebody had asked about. Uh, TSAMP is the one that's included with most DB2 licenses. Um, so it's the one we tend to use. There's a command called DB2 Haiku that we can use to set it up. I'm not going to go through all the setup scenarios because honestly, I have a 75 minute presentation on that alone. <laughs> so, um, the, but there are other options that require some uh, custom scripting and setup. Um, you can use HACMP or Power HA. I've done that. Um, you can use Linux HA, you can use Red Hat clustering services, you can use Microsoft clustering services. IBM has on their roadmap um, some sort of integration with Pacemaker. I don't know what that's going to look like, but it's on their public roadmap um, that they may be considering some integration with Pacemaker. Um, really, you could use any tool that performs these kind of actions. Um, ones uh, I've been considering lately maybe in uh, AWS using a Lambda function. That might be an interesting way to, to go about um, handling this as well. So some of the concepts to be aware of, uh, there's a heartbeat that will detect if DB2 is down and either try to restart it locally or uh, take over HADR if DB2 seems to be down on the other server. Uh, takeover requires that you have peer window properly set. Um, and you should use, um, if you're scripting this yourself, you need to use a, a, 
uh, takeover by force with peer window only syntax on any force takeover. Um, otherwise, you can run into split brain or some fairly serious scenarios. Um, and also, you're only automating failover between two high availability servers on the same subnet. Um, that doesn't mean they have to be in the same location. If you can stretch your layer two to another data center, that's fine, but they have to be on the same subnet. Um, and the automation is only between two servers. You can't automate it between all of the servers. If you're going to use TSAMP, I'm sorry, go ahead. We have questions. Maybe you're going to cover it on this slide. You never know with questions. Yep. Uh, why should you bring up the standby database before the primary database? So if both servers are down, um, the well, if if well, if the primary server has gone down, then when it comes up, it looks for its standby before it allows connections. And this is to prevent a, a split brain scenario where both servers are up and taking connections, which is kind of a nightmare scenario for a DBA. Um, so if you bring both servers up and you don't bring HADR up on the standby first, then you won't be able to connect to the primary. You can force it. There's absolutely a way to force it, but in general, it's going to look and make sure that that standby hasn't taken over and become primary itself before it starts up. Great. And Jean Bernard would like to know, can I have a standby on the cloud, such as Azure or AWS? Only if you can somehow stretch. Well, OK, you can absolutely have a standby on the cloud. Um, if you want to automate failover between the two, it gets a lot more complicated, because that's only if you can manage to stretch a layer two uh, network in order to uh, be on the same subnet. Um, so it, it's possible to do it to the cloud. Uh, just keep in mind, you probably don't want to use one of the high availability modes for that. That's probably a DR mode that you're going to be using. Uh, Vinod would like to know, TSAMP is automatic or needs a manual takeover? TSAMP is, automates the takeover for you. Um, you can always do manual takeovers too, but that's the whole point of TSAMP or a similar tool is to automate that for you. And Brian contributes other options, Veritas InfoScale, yep. which is and a new name for Veritas VCS. I've seen Veritas used. I haven't set it up myself, but I have seen that used in the real world. So that's absolutely another option. I can't name them all. So. All right, the question queue has been cleared. Please Great. continue your awesome presentation. Okay, so TSAMP, there are some steps you have to go through. I have a great series of five or six different blog entries on, on how to go through this process um, and how to make the decisions. There's some decisions you have to make as far as the, the inputs that are required, and you come up with this list of required things. Before you start, you have to know the public IP address of both database servers. You need the fully qualified host names of both database servers. You need the IP address of a quorum device, and a quorum device is just a highly available IP that you can ping, usually a, um, a, a domain controller or something along those lines. And you need the names of the network cards associated with the pu public network on the server uh, and the, the same kind of information if there's a private network as well. And this is that detailed blog series on how to set it up. Um, there's actually a part five, yeah, okay, the, it's in here, uh, of stuff I learned the hard way after I had already done the rest of it, so other best practices to include. Any questions? Not at the moment. Carry okay, on. Great. Let's dig into the real world scenarios. First, um, I want to make clear what split brain is. Split brain is when something happens to the network between the database servers and clients are somehow able to connect to both of them. Um, and that can mean that both databases are taking traffic and changing data, and they might change the same piece of data. You can run out of inventory for your widgets, and then people keep buying widgets because the other database server doesn't agree. Recovering for this is a DBA from this is a DBA's worst nightmare to go in and try to figure out what changed on each server and reconcile that. Um, it's really a, a, a nightmare scenario. So problem scenario number one I call, were you trying to cause split brain? So in this particular scenario, we have four servers in our HADR cluster, two are HA and two are DR. They are in data centers that are halfway across the country from each other. What should have happened in this particular scenario, what, what we needed to do is we needed to take down the standby database servers so they could patch the OS on both of them. 
Um, so they were patching the OS in the, in the DR data center. So we should have taken those servers down and brought them back up and then brought the databases, brought HADR and the databases back up and made sure they catch up. In this particular scenario, I was brought in as kind of an expert DBA. They had a much cheaper group of DBAs who were doing the actual work. Um, and I wasn't called in until at least halfway through this problem to, to figure out what was going on. So what actually happened, um, somebody issued a takeover. So they took over um, uh, on and made server number three the primary. And then they panicked because they knew they'd done something wrong and they shut down both servers in the data center. And this was outage number one. We had 45 minutes in the middle of the night. Um, it didn't take too long for somebody to figure out, hey, we need to make this guy primary and to start that guy as primary by force. So they got it back up right then um, and, and solved that problem for then. However, when they brought it up, um, they brought the servers back up. One of the standbys integrated just fine and the other one wouldn't integrate. It wouldn't go back into the cluster because it had been primary um, at one point and there were, there were issues. And so what somebody did did is somebody tried to start that one as the primary. They issued a start HADR on database as primary. Um, and that's absolutely not what they should have done. If, if anything, they probably should have uh, reinitialized HADR on the server. Or if they were going to try to start it, start it as a standby, not as primary. DB2 saw that and these two servers could still talk to each other and it went, oh my God, I have two primaries. I'm going down so that I don't get split brain. And that's exactly what we want DB2 to do. We want DB2 to, to take an outage instead of going into split brain. Um, and it was a really fun message in the DB2 diagnostic log. It said poison pill, um, which was never a message that I had never seen before in the diagnostic log. The, the RCA for this was quite interesting. Um, so what happened then is they brought me in and I started this guy by force. Uh, I made sure that the second server, the second uh, server here was was integrated just fine. And um, and what they brought down the two servers in the DR data center. They were panicked. They're like, oh, my God, if we start them up, then it's going to take our primary database down, which wasn't true. But um, they were worried about it. So those actually stayed down for multiple days because they were afraid of it and they wanted to schedule it on a weekend. It was fine when we brought it back up and we reinitialized HADR on server three. Uh, but that was not exactly the funnest scenario to deal with. And I've got a lot of um, text in here. If you want to go over any of these, I'll provide the PDF. Um, if you want to go over any of these scenarios in more detail yourselves. Um, the moral of the story on this one is to define your procedures really well for less experienced DBAs. Um, and when a mistake occurs, stop for a minute, figure out what happened and the best way to undo it. Because a lot of the problems there were caused by people panicking and just doing the first thing that they thought. Show us that previous slide again for just another moment. The one that had back up one more. This one? No, oh, that one. This one here. Oh, this just one. in case people, yeah, in case people are watching the replay, okay. and you know they can they can pause the video and and digest this. Okay. It's probably a lot of good stuff on here, and and you know we're coming up on the top of the hour, but don't don't feel rushed. We can run over. Yeah, I've got I've got three more scenarios, maybe about 10 minutes. OK, carry on. OK, so um, the real world problem number two, we had some issues relating to load. So in this particular scenario, um, we have a two server scenario. These two servers, they happen to be running on a pure app. It doesn't really matter for the purposes here. There was a VIP in front of them um, the, that was directing clients to the right server. We also had a, ser uh, a shared disk that lived somewhere else. The shared disk uh, was called DB2 copy and it was used for their loads. When they did a load, they would say copy yes to DB2 copy. And, um, and their scripts were all written that way and we had done education with them on how that needed to happen. Um, I also had uh, block non-logged set to yes. Um, and I also set a registry variable called db2 load copy no override set to copy yes to db2 copy. So I had every db2 parameter possible to try to make things happen the right way set for this scenario. 
Um, and what happened is I noticed on the standby, I was getting a lot of log messages like this, and I didn't understand what this log message was trying to tell me. It's a very sparse log message. Um, so I called support and I asked them to, you know, what, what's this log message is just scrolling through my diagnostic log and using up all this space. And um, they told me that I had a, uh, a table space uh, 14, table space number 14 was in a recovery pending state. And that was because somebody had done a load copy uh, with copy yes to slash temp. So they hadn't used the location we had for that, they had selected another location. None of the parameters I had set prevented them from doing this. And so I have an aha idea or an RFE uh, created to give me something else to make it so that people can't do this. Um, the solution in this case was to restore the table spaces that are in recovery uh, pending on the standby. I did that so fast. I was freaking out about that. Um, and then to educate users and developers again on appropriate locations for the copy file. Uh, and we also implemented a monitor to parse the DB2 diagnostic log to look for those errors so that we could uh, catch them right away when they first happened rather than weeks or months later, you know, trying to find it out like that. Um, so uh, if you if you have a standby and you want to see if anything like this is occurring, if you have reads on standby enabled, you can run this uh, particular query and it will give you any tables or table spaces that have this issue occurring for them. Um, it's a nice way to, to be able to check proactively for the problem. So the moral of this story is you want to educate your developers and users, um, but then you also need to not trust them and monitor thoroughly to, to verify that things are going right. And you don't want to ignore messages in the diagnostic log that you don't understand. Okay, the next scenario I have here um, is a four server multi data center layout. We've got two HA, we've got the primary and the principal standby in the HA data center. And then over in the DR data center, we have two more. Um, what, what was happening here is they were doing a load test on their failover, which I absolutely applaud. Test your failovers as much as you can and load test while you're failed over if you can, because you can learn some interesting things. So what was supposed to happen here is we were supposed to fail over our primary. And when we failed over our primary, the principal standby should have moved as well, because we always want our principal standby to be in the same data center as our primary. Um, and what actually, uh, and then the clients were supposed to connect and do their load test. Um, what actually happened was they failed over the primary, but the principal standby stayed where it was. It didn't move. It was So we had this going across data centers here. Um, and that's the point at which they called me because they were they were running their clients against this primary and they're going, oh my gosh, the application is so slow. What is wrong with this data center? Um, and so they called me at this point and that's where I came in to say, hey, you've got a misconfiguration. It was only one variable that caused this issue and it's that HADR target list. HADR target list was not set properly. It had the wrong server in that first position that defines the principal standby. So when we fixed it, um, everything was fine. The problem just completely went away. The moral of the story there is always test takeovers, load test your takeovers and verify your configurations because there can be things that you wouldn't expect that might show up like that. Okay, and my final one, um, this is a different environment. Um, this one, we had they had two, uh, two servers in one data center um, and then an extra standby in a, in a DR data center. They were actually using super async for both of them, um, which I'm not really a fan of for your, your local data center, but they were using super async for both standbys. They brought me in because they were having issues. Um, their issues were related to congestion and log gap. They were monitoring for congestion and log gap and they were finding constant congestion and constant log gaps. And what that means is that the standbys were too far behind the primaries. They were having issues with keeping up fast enough in order to, to uh, minimize data loss. So I went and I graphed it all out. Um, uh, the yellow lines here are congested states. The red is how high the log gap was on a scale over here that's actually quite big. If you notice this, it's a decimal with eight zeros after it. 
Um, and so this is what it looked like on the standby one. We had significant congestion every single day, log, significant log gaps every single day. And then on standby two, we did the same thing and it was even worse. Um, there were almost all day, every day uh, during business hours, we had congestion and there were log gaps as well there. So what I did is I got them on a meeting and I talked to their system admins and they had their network admins and their VMware guys and all of this on the phone. Um, and I talked about some of the things that might cause this and some of the directions my investigation was going to take. And I started poking around in several of those directions. And I noticed that from one week to the next, I saw some differences um, and I started to investigate and I graphed the data again. Notice this is about a week later. Um, and what I saw is, bam, on 9-18 of uh, 2018, it just started going great. And it was like this for weeks afterwards as well. Um, we saw no log gap and we saw only uh, occasional congestion, not very much at all on the pr primary standby. And we saw the same thing for the standby number two there. There was a little bit more. We had these periods of congestion, but those were generally associated with either backups or reorgs. Um, and then we had, um, and, and so I asked them, I got them on, a, on the same kind of meeting and I said, oh, this is great. What'd you change, right? I figured somebody had found something and, and changed something. Oh, we didn't change anything. Nobody admitted to ever changing anything. But I mean, the thing they had engaged me for was an HADR health check. And the answer now was, hey, it's good, <laughs> right? So the, the moral of the story there is, don't be afraid to engage experts in other areas. Sometimes the problem will magically fix itself. It's well known that all experts come from out of town. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> And there's your contact information. Yep, this is my contact information. I love to talk tech. I love to talk DB2. I'd love to get emails, start a conversation on Twitter. I'm always checking Reddit on the RDB2 subreddit. You know, those are all great locations to get a hold of me. All right, uh, check the question queue. Oh, goodness. Is it possible, is Connect possible on both servers with VIP? Um, so it it's possible because you uh, not if you're you have one VIP and you're connecting to that one VIP, but there are a couple of scenarios where you can connect to the standby server either by connecting directly to the IP of the standby server, or by having two VIPs, one uh, for your uh, for your read only traffic um, that is mostly pointing at your standby, but sometimes points to your primary when it's not available. In those cases, you can absolutely have traffic going either way. Uh, but the VIP can only be on one server at a time. So as long as that matches what your primary server is, and as long as every connection comes in via that IP address, you should not have connections on your standby. That's a quality long answer. <laughs> it's Sorry. So much of this is it depends, right? Yep. And uh, some people are asking for a PDF. Would you be able to share a PDF? Absolutely. I'll send that over to you this afternoon. Okay, great. And what do you mean by reinitialize HADR, please, Stuart? Reinitialize HADR means you take a backup of the primary, you move it over to the standby, you restore the backup on the standby, and then you start HADR and you wait for it to be in sync. Okay. Uh, you can monitor this also with DB2 Dart um, standby. Says hmm. Guy. Guy is okay. very knowledgeable. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. I I haven't used the DB2 Dart methodology, but that's good to know. How to avoid DIA 8312C disk was full error in standby during heavy load in primary. Hmm, it sounds to me like you might have a mismatch on size for your transaction log file directory. That would be my first guess. Uh, but it, you would have to know which which directory you're getting that error message for. Uh, FYI, use 11.1.4.4 and above, there was an issue with buffer cache clearing on principal standby in earlier version and use it to slow down on principal standby read on standby. I have not tried read on standby on auxiliary standby. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so, for security issues, certainly you'd want to be on 11.1.4.4 .1 .4 anyway. So. 
Luke would like to know how you collected the data for those graphs in scenario three. So in scenario three, they were it was actually the DBAs that I was coming in to work with. Um, they were actually querying um, Monget HADR every three minutes and writing that out to a history table. Um, so they had that available for me to query so I could look at what was going on. It was fabulous to have that kind of data. Brian, thanks you for the presentation. Uh, as are others thanking you, real life scenario number four, what is your best guess? My for the best performance improvement. Yeah, my best guess is there there was some networking bottleneck. That's my best guess. Um, but it it could have been a disk thing. Um, the 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 standbys were both virtual while the primary was um, on uh, on physical hardware. So it could have been a, a a networking issue between that. It could have been that their pipe just wasn't quite large enough for this part of the network, and they increased that in some way. I, I don't know for sure. Okay, and I'll give you one more question from Felipe. Uh, have faced more issues with, have you faced more issues with TSA or HADR itself? Have you faced? Oh, HADR is easy. Um, TSAMP is hard. That's the way I think of it. Um, HADR mm -hmm. just works and it's easy to set up. TSAMP is complicated. It's easy to make little mistakes. Um, you know, it, you really have to be careful with, with TSAMP. Um, they have some really good people, though, uh, at support. If you call in the middle of the night, there's a great guy in England who helped me out a couple of times, you know, so they have some really good people supporting it if you need help. Okay. And our last polling question, did you learn anything today? I'd like to thank everyone in our audience for being here. Super lively group, lots of great questions. Questions make presentations better. And Ember, thank you very much for being our guest. Thank you for having and, me, it's a great show. Yeah, and uh, thank you to our sponsors. Uh, the Data View Show is sponsored by the IBM community. Make sure you've joined. And you're going to find your replays and show news at dataviewshow.com slash news. Okay, going once, going twice. We're going to close this poll and share the answers. Nice. Remember, 98% of today's very good-looking audience learned something from you. Awesome. Uh, I guess a couple people were experts like you or something. I want to learn from them. Lab. I want to talk maybe, to them and learn from them. <laughs> Maybe they're lab people, who knows? But, you know, nothing is stronger than being a graduate from the School of Hard Knocks and working through the problems that you have. And that's really great that you shared. Okay, so that's it for the polling questions. Time to put on our farewell music. And uh, wish everybody a great day and a great Friday and a lovely weekend. We'll have the replay up in about... 24 hours or so. Remember, remember to send me that PDF and we'll share it. Sounds great. All right, that's it. Bye bye, everybody. Um, um.